Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters. I'm your host, Mitch. Glad to have you here. If this is your first time, let me give you a quick rundown on what we're all about. Here at the Commander's Quarters, we build fun and inexpensive focused Commander decks. A focused Commander deck is more attuned than a casual deck, but not quite to the level of a competitive or optimized deck. Today's episode is going to be a special one, though, where we exclude the cost of the Commander. With just a $25 budget, it's pretty much impossible to build around some Commanders unless we do so. Sometimes you get lucky and open up a Commander in a pack, or you could just trade for them if you really want to build around them. So our budget is still going to be $25, but again, that's $25 for just 99 cards because we're excluding the cost of that commander. And prices on this show are powered by our sponsor, TCG Player. Before we get started today, though, make sure you go check out our new classic pink playmat and Commander's Quarters t-shirts on thecommandersquarters.com. And thank you to everyone who's already purchased our merchandise. It really does help support the channel. Also, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and click that little bell notification icon so that you can stay up to date on the latest Commander's Quarters episodes. Today's commander is Prime Speaker Vanifar. Vanifar is a 2-4 Elf Ooze Wizard that costs 2 green blue. She has tap, sacrifice another creature, search your library for a creature card with converted mana cost equal to 1 plus the sacrifice creature's converted mana cost, put that creature onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. Activate this ability only anytime you could cast a sorcery. So this is an extremely powerful ability and we can do some pretty broken things with it. In fact, with even the simplest setup, we can pretty much just win the game as soon as we have her out and ready to tap. So what's our strategy for the deck? Well, we want to get at least one creature in our commander into play. In order to start our combo, we need at least one creature to sack with her ability. So we need to make sure that we can get her out, protect her, and then sacrifice that first creature to get things started. And then how do we win with this deck? Well, we need to go all the way up the chain and then combo off to win. So when I say go up the chain, I mean we're going to be going from a 3 converted mana cost creature to a 4, to a 5, etc, etc. This will lead us to a combo that can win us the game on the spot with the right setup. As with all Commander's Quarters decks, I'm going to break this deck down into 10 different tactics that show you how the deck works and how you're going to win with it. So let's go on to tactic number one, Seed Pods. We're going to be running quite a few mana dorks in this deck because not only do they help us ramp to get to our commander, but they're also great targets for her. So we're going to be running Llanowar Elves and Elvish Mystic, each of which tap for a green. And then there's Arbor Elf, which will tap to untap Target Forest. Next up, there's Harvester Druid and Naga Vitalist, each of which can tap for either of our colors depending on our land situation. And Void Jinx Hater can help us in a similar way by tapping to untap target land. Next up, there's Quirion Explorer and Silvok Explorer, both of which can tap to add to our mana pool one mana of any color that a land and opponent controls could produce. So in the right situation, either of these can tap for either of our colors. And then there's Copper Mirror, which can tap for a green, and Silver Mirror, which can tap for a blue. Next, we have Servant of the Conduit and Channeler Initiate, both of which can tap for either of our colors, but a limited number of times. This isn't really that big of a limitation for this deck because, again, we just want to get Vanifar out quickly so we can combo off. And finally, we're going to be running Quirion Elves, Drover the Mighty, and Beast Caller Savant, each of which can tap for either of our colors. Beast Caller Savant does have haste, but there is a limitation that it can only spend its mana to cast a creature spell. The vast majority of mana dorks in this deck have a converted mana cost of 2, which is the sweet spot for starting our chain. So we've been talking a lot about this chain and the combination of creatures that are in it. Let's go through them now in tactic number 2, the chain. So after Vanifar is able to tap and sacrifice one of those two converted mana cost mana dorks, we're going to be getting one of these three creatures. Pestermite, Deceiver, Exarch, and Bounding Crassus do the exact same thing for us in this deck. When they come into play, they're going to untap Vanifar. And as soon as they do that, we can tap Vanifar again to sacrifice them to search our library for a creature with converted mana cost 4. And that creature is going to be Breaching Hippocamp, which does the exact same thing. When it comes into play, we can untap Vanifar. Then we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to tap to sacrifice the Hippocamp and search our library for a creature with converted mana cost 5. Now this is where we have a small decision to make. We can either go get Chakram Retriever or we can get Disciple of the Ring. Chakram Retriever has, whenever you cast a spell during your turn, untap target creature. So if we have a cheap spell in our hand that we can cast to untap Vanifar, we're going to get Chakram Retriever. And then there's Disciple of the Ring, which has, pay one, exile an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to untap target creature. So if we already have an instant or sorcery in our graveyard, we can just do that. Either way, once we untap Vanifar and then tap her again to sacrifice one of these two creatures, we're going to go search up Great Oak Guardian. When Great Oak Guardian enters the battlefield, creatures that we control are going to get plus two, plus two until the end of the turn, but the important part is that we get to untap them. Now that we've gotten to the creature that has a converted mana cost of six, we're getting close to the end of the chain. So when we tap to sacrifice Great Oak Guardian, we're going to search our library for a creature with converted mana cost seven, and that's going to be the start of our combo. So what exactly is that combo? Let's go through it now in tactic number three, the combo meal. So the creature that's going to start this combo is actually the golden pig for this deck, and that's the number one card out of our 99. And that creature is going to be Protean Hulk. Protean Hulk is a 6-6 beast that costs 5 green green. It has when Protean Hulk dies, search your library for any number of creature cards with total converted mana cost 6 or less and put them onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So when we sacrifice Protean Hulk with Vanifar, two things are going to happen. With Vanifar's effect, we're going to be able to go get one creature that has a converted mana cost of 8. 
And with Protean Hulk's effect, we can go get any number of creatures with total converted mana cost of six or less. All these creatures are going to go straight onto the battlefield and we can easily combo off with the right combination of creatures. This is an absolutely incredible effect and this deck would not work without Protean Hulk and that's why it's the golden pick of the deck. So the creature that we're going to go get that has a converted mana cost of eight is Tide Spout Tyrant. It says, whenever you cast a spell, return target permanent to its owner's hand. This is an extremely powerful effect and will let us go infinite with the right combination of creatures. So two of the creatures that we're going to be grabbing from Protean Hulk's Death Trigger are going to be Grand Architect and Pilly Pala. In combination, these two creatures can create infinite mana right away. Here's how it works. One of Grand Architect's abilities is tap an untapped blue creature you control to add two colorless mana to your mana pool and then spend this mana to cast artifact spells or activate abilities of artifacts. And then for a blue mana, it can make target artifact creature blue until the end of the turn. And then Pilly Pala has pay two and untap it to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So by paying just one blue mana, we can make Pilly Pala into a blue creature and then it can tap to add colorless to our mana pool to activate abilities of artifacts. When it does that, we can pay that two mana into its own ability to untap it to add one mana of any color to our mana pool. We can effectively do this as many times as we want to create infinite mana of all colors. Now, infinite mana is nice, but it actually doesn't win you the game. Remember that Protean Hulk actually allows us to go get a total converted mana cost of 6 and Pilly Pala and Grand Architect only take up 5 of that. So we're also going to be going to go get Phyrexian Walker and Ornithopter, both of which aren't going to cost us anything. They might seem like an odd include, but it's all going to make sense as soon as we get to our next creature. Because again, our total converted mana cost right now is only 5 and we still have one more to go. So that creature's either going to be Marowit Sniper or Shrieking Drake, depending on what we have in our hand. Let's go through these cards first and then we'll go through each of the combos. When Merowit Sniper comes into play, target player is going to have to put the top card of his or her library into their graveyard. And then when Shrieking Drake comes into play, we have to return a creature we control back to our hand. If we have any spell in our hand that we can cast, we're going to be choosing Merowit Sniper. If we don't, we're going to choose Shrieking Drake. So let's go through scenario one and choose Merowit Sniper. And remember, at this point, we have infinite mana to cast any number of spells. So the combo works like this. We're going to cast one of our spells in our hand. And again, it doesn't really matter what that spell is. We just need to get that trigger off of Tide's Bound Tyrant. So with Tide Spawn Tyrant's trigger, we're going to target Mara Wit Sniper and put it back into our hand. Then we're going to cast Mara Wit Sniper and return Ornithopter back to our hand. And when Mara Wit Sniper comes into play, we're going to mill one of our opponents for one. Then we're going to cast Ornithopter again, returning Mara Wit Sniper back to our hand. We're going to repeat this process as many times as it takes to completely mill out our opponents and then they lose the game. Again, the decision to pick Mara Wit Sniper though over Shrieking Drake completely depends on if we have a spell to cast from our hand. Since we have infinite mana, most of the time we will be able to cast one of our spells, but if we don't have any spells in our hand to cast, we're going to have to pick Shrieking Drake. So now let's go through that scenario. When Shrieking Drake enters the battlefield, we have to return a creature we control back to our hand, so we're going to return Shrieking Drake. With our infinite mana, we can recast Shrieking Drake. When we cast it, it's going to trigger Tide Spout Tyrant, and we can target any of our opponent's permanents to return it to their hand. And then when Shrieking Drake enters the battlefield, it's going to trigger and we have to return a creature back to our hand, we're going to return Shrieking Drake again. We can repeat this process over and over again as many times as we want to return all of our opponent's permanents back to their hands. While this doesn't win us the game immediately, it completely locks out our opponents from playing by bouncing every single one of their permanents back to their hands, including their lands. And then next turn we can finish off all of our opponents at the same time by using Vanifar's ability to get one of our secondary win conditions. While picking Shrieking Drake doesn't win us the game right away, it's still a very effective way for us to win. Either way, this deck completely depends on our commander's ability, so we need to make sure that we can protect her. So let's go through some ways to do that in tactic number 4, Prime Time. First up, we're going to be running Swiftfoot Boots, which serves a dual purpose for this deck. By equipping it to our commander, it's going to give her Hexproof and Haste. So not only can this piece of equipment protect her, but it can also give her Haste so we can get our combo going right away. And then we're going to be running Hepatra's Mark, Ranger's Guile, and Blossoming Defense, each of which are going to give her Hexproof. Next up is Mizium Skin, which can either give her Hexproof, or we can overload it to give our entire team Hexproof. And then Simic Charm is a very flexible card, but most of the time we're just going to be using it to give all of our permanents Hexproof until the end of the turn. Finally, we're going to be running Withstand Death and Mortal's Resolve to give her Indestructible until the end of the turn. Hexproof usually does the job for us, but Indestructible can be even better in case of a board wipe. Both are very effective at keeping her alive though, and again, this deck revolves around her, so we need to make sure that we can do that so we can combo off. But we've got plenty of other ways to stop our opponents from disrupting our combo. Let's go through them now in tactic number 5, Combo Keeper. First up there's Intervene, which is going to counter a spell that targets a creature. And then Turn Aside is similar, it's going to counter a spell that targets a permanent that we control. Like our protection spells, our counter spells are also going to be low in converted mana cost to ensure that we can cast them when we're going off. So we're also going to be using Dispel, which is going to counter target Instant Spell. Next up we're going to be running Negate, which is going to counter target non-creature spell, so it's a little more flexible. And then there's Memory Lapse, which is going to counter target spell, and if that spell is countered this way, it goes on top of their library instead of into their graveyard. We don't really care that this goes on top of their library, because again, if we're comboing off correctly, it won't matter. And we also really don't care about our opponents drawing cards, so we're also going to be running Arcane Denial. And finally, we're going to be running Autumn's Veil, which technically isn't a counter spell, but it prevents our opponents from playing them. 
It says spells you control can't be countered by blue or black spells this turn, and creatures you control can't be the targets of blue or black spells this turn. This is a fantastic card that truly limits our opponent's options when they're trying to stop us. All of these protection spells and counter spells are invaluable at protecting our commander and our combo pieces. But there will be times though where we can't protect our commander no matter how hard we try. So when we recast her, we still want to combo off as soon as we can. So let's go through some ways that we can combo off right away in tactic number 6, speed things up. First up there's Ring of Valkus, which is an equipment that can give Vanifar haste. Since it only costs us 1 to equip, it's very easy for us to cast Vanifar, equip this, and then immediately go off. And then we're also going to be running Haunted Cloak, which is slightly worse since it does cost us 1 more, but it still has the same effect. If we're running against control heavy decks, it can be very beneficial for us to just wait to get Vanifar out and then give her haste and then go off. But it's also important for us to have some other ways to untap her in case we need them. We can either use it as a response if someone's trying to kill her or the creature that we're trying to sacrifice, or we can even use it to do our entire combo in one turn since Protean Hulk doesn't untap her. So let's go through some of those spells that help us untap her in tactic number 7, turn it around. First up there's Wirewood Symbiote, which has Return an Elf you control to its owner's hand, untap target creature, activate this ability only once each turn. This is a very flexible card for this deck since it can help us return one of our elf mana dorks back to our hand to untap our commander. Also, if our commander's in danger, we can just straight up return her back to our hand to protect her. And then there's Seeker of Skybreak, which we can tap to untap Vanifar. Kiora's Follower does the exact same thing, but it can untap any permanent, so it can even untap our lands. This is perhaps the best mana dork for us to get out on turn 2 so we can cast Vanifar on turn 3. Next up is Vizier of Tumbling Sands, which is a fantastic card in this deck. When it's in play, we can tap it to untap another target permanent, or we can cycle it and then untap target permanent. This card has a lot of flexibility, because if it's in our hand, we can still get use out of it. And then there's Cerulean Wisp, which says, Target creature becomes blue until the end of the turn, untap that creature, draw a card. Being able to untap Vanifar while cantripping is huge. And then Vitalize is going to straight up untap all creatures that we control. This can be particularly effective when we have something like Hiora's Follower in play. And finally, we're going to be running Nature's Chosen, which is an aura that says, Pay zero, untap enchanted creature, activate this ability only during your turn, and only once each turn. So this is a very cheap effect that we can use more than once over multiple turns if we need to. There is still something that we need to consider with our combo though. What if one of our combo pieces is actually in our hand? Let's talk about some ways to deal with that in tactic number 8, back on top. First up there's Brainstorm, which is going to let us draw 3 cards and then put 2 cards from our hand on top of our library in any order. This card can come in huge for our deck. If we have something like Great Oak Guardian or Protean Hulk in our hand, we need to get them back into our library. And then we're going to be running Riverwise Augur, which has the exact same effect but can be slightly better in this deck. Since it's a creature, we can actually use Vanifar's ability to go get it if we need to. While getting it instead of breaching Hippocamp is going to stop our chain, it is important that we get our combo pieces into our deck. And if we have a card like Vitalize that can untap our commander, we can just keep our chain going anyways. So there is still one more thing that we need to consider. What happens if one of our key chain or combo pieces gets put into our graveyard by being killed or being milled? We need some ways to make sure that we can still get them back into our library so that we can win the game. Let's go through some ways to do that in tactic number 9, Shuffling Home. First up there's Felden's Cane, which we can tap to sacrifice it to shuffle our graveyard back into our library. This card is great in this deck because we can get it out whenever we need to and then just use it for free. And then there's Memory's Journey, which allows us to shuffle 3 cards from our graveyard back into our library. On top of that it has flashback, so even if it's countered or milled, we can still use it. Next up we're going to be running Piper's Melody and Renewing Touch, both of which do the exact same thing. They're going to allow us to shuffle any number of target creature cards from our graveyard back into our library. Again, our combo is completely centered around creatures, so those are the cards that we really need to worry about getting back. And finally, there's Loaming Shaman, which when it enters the battlefield, we can make target players shuffle any number of target cards from their graveyard into their library. The best part about this card is that it's a creature, so we can tutor for it with Vanifar's ability. This can come in huge if we don't have any of our other cards that help us shuffle cards back that we need. Alright, so we talked about our combo and protecting it, and making sure that we can ensure that we get our combo off. But a while back I also mentioned some secondary win conditions, so let's go through them now in tactic number 10, the backups. First up there's Azura Mage, which has pay 3 and a blue, draw a card. Now this might seem like an odd include in the deck, but hear me out. Once we're generating infinite mana, we can just draw our entire deck with this card and then win. Now our other ways to win are very solid, but there are still some small scenarios where they don't work out perfectly. With our first scenario, we milled out all of our opponents. There are still some ways though where they can shuffle their graveyard into their library. And then in scenario 2, we bounced all their permanents back to their hands. But they can still float mana and then cast something that might be able to slow us down. By running cards like Azure Mage, we can make the most use out of our infinite mana. And if we have a creature with converted mana cost 1, like Mirror Wit Sniper in play, we can even sacrifice it to go get this. Now we want to have these kind of effects at different converted mana costs in case we have something different on the field. So we're also going to be running Shapers of Nature. With infinite mana, Shapers of Nature can make every single one of our creatures infinitely big and can draw us our entire deck. Most likely we won't need those infinitely large creatures to win, but it can't hurt to have them. Because our true finisher in this deck that can win us the game on the spot is Lore Weaver. With infinite mana we can make all of our opponents draw out their entire decks right away. While this deck is combo driven, it can be very durable and flexible to win in different ways. 
But now that we've gone through the cards that help us win with this deck, let's go through the cards that help make it happen. It's time to go on to the mana base. First up is Evolving Wilds and Terramorphic Expanse, both of which we can tap to sacrifice the Surtar Library for basic land to put into play tapped. Then we're going to be running Warp Landscape, which can either tap for a colorless, or we can pay 2 to tap and sacrifice it to search our library for a basic land to put into play tapped. Next up we've got Willow and Stream, Simic Guildgate, and Thornwood Falls, each of which enter the battlefield tapped and tap for either a green or a blue, and on top of that, Thornwood Falls is going to gain us one life when it comes into play. And then there's Simic Growth Chamber, which enters the battlefield tapped and is going to make us return a land back to our hand, but it does have the upside of tapping for green-blue. Finally, we're going to be running 28 basic lands in this deck, 17 of those are going to be a forest, and 11 will be an island. And now that we've gone through every single card in this deck, let's do a quick price check. A quick reminder that our deck costs are calculated using TCG player optimization, optimizing with even heavily played and damaged cards because those cards need a home too. Because this is a brand new commander, EDH Rec doesn't actually have any decks that are built with her yet. But I can guarantee you that as soon as EDH Rec does have those prices, the average is going to be much higher than the cost of our deck, which is just $24.96. And just a quick reminder that our deck cost actually doesn't include our commander because it is a commander excluded episode. Again, Commander's Quarters decks are built to be tuned and focused within their budget, but there are always ways that we can improve on them. So let's go through some reasonable upgrades to see what some of those ways just might be. First up, there's Wirewood Lodge, which comes in at $3.91. It's a land that can either tap for a colorless, or we can pay a green to tap into untapped target elf. This is a fantastic effect to have on a land since it can untap our commander. And then there's Query and Ranger, which comes in at $2.03. It's a 1-1 elf that costs a green, and it has return a forest you control to its owner's hand, untapped target creature, use this ability only once each turn. This is a fantastic way to untap our commander on a creature that only has a converted mana cost of 1 like Wirewood Symbiote. Next up, there's Scrib Ranger, which comes in at $4.54. Scrib Ranger is a 1 1 fairy that costs 1 in a green. It has Flash, Flying Protection from Blue, and Return a Forest you control to its owner's hand, untap target creature, play this ability only once each turn. Scrib Ranger is a fantastic untap creature at that 2 drop slot, but unfortunately, its price rose as soon as this commander got spoiled. It's a great reasonable upgrade, and if you can't afford it, I definitely recommend adding this one in. And then there's Thousand Year Elixir, which comes in at $5.62. It's an artifact that costs 3 and it says you may activate abilities of creatures you control as though those creatures had haste and you can pay 1 to tap it to untap target creature. So not only does this give our commander and things like Heora's Follower haste, but we can also use it to untap our commander. Next up there's Woodland Bellower which comes in at $2.66. It's a 6-5 beast that costs 4 green green. It says when Woodland Bellower enters the battlefield you may search your library for a non-legendary green creature card with converted mana cost 3 or less, put it onto the battlefield then shuffle your library. So if we can't go get Great Oak Guardian, we can just go get Woodland Bellower, which will search up Bounding Crassus, and that can untap our commander to keep the chain going. Finally, there's Heroic Intervention, which comes in at $6.35. It's an instant that costs 1 in a green, and it says Permanence you control gain Hexproof and Indestructible until the end of the turn. This is a fantastic way for us to help protect all of our combo pieces, including our commander. And with that, our show is coming to a close, but I really just want to hear about what you think about this deck, so why don't you let me know in the comments below. When you're buying decks like this one, or just individual cards, make sure you use that decklist link in the description below. Not only will you be getting great prices on TCG Player, but you're also going to be supporting this show because they sponsor us. And make sure that you follow us on social media so you can get some early hints on who the next commander just might be. Links to our social media accounts can be found in the description. Also in the description below is a link to the Commander's Quarters Patreon page, and I just want to say a quick thank you to the patrons who have subscribed so far. There are many benefits to being a patron for the Commander's Quarters, including being able to vote on future commanders for deck techs. There's even a general level tier where you get your own personalized deck tech dedicated to you. I truly couldn't do this without all of your support, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you. If you haven't already, make sure that you like and subscribe to the channel, and then check out some of our playlists on budget commander decks, commander excluded decks, and break the bank episodes. And with that, I'm out of here. Thanks again, and have a good one.